Hi everyone, my name is McGurk, and welcome to the top 7 reasons Valkyrie Profile is exceptional. Valkyrie Profile is a Japanese role-playing game for PlayStation 1, developed by Triace and published by Enix back in 2000, before Enix merged with Square. I have a lot of love for this series, and the first game is no exception. Let's get into it. Number 7. Limited Time the game is set during a time of preparation for the coming catastrophe of Ragnarok. The overall game is divided into chapters, and each visit to a dungeon or town spends a set amount of the chapter's time. This limits you to a finite amount of level grinding, which ensures the level of challenge throughout the game and spreads out the leveling up over the course of the game. It's also immersive for the story because Ragnarok is going to happen at a certain time, and the entire game is about preparing for it, so it should feel like you only have so much time to do that. Uh, one of my pet peeves is when an RPG story will make it seem like something is in immediate danger, but you're free to leave and do all the side quests you want, but when you go back to that immediate danger, you still made it just in time. That kind of thing doesn't happen here. Number 6. The Mechanics for Getting the Different Endings I'll keep this without spoilers, even though it's a game from 2000. You can get three different endings depending on your actions over the course of the game. There's a variable that gets adjusted up or down throughout the game in response to things you choose to do several times each chapter, which after a certain point can trigger the bad ending. Some of these choices are laid out directly, like a choose-your-own-adventure sort of choice, but others are less apparent, where you might not even realize you were making a choice that affected this. The less apparent choices aren't random either. They make sense when you know what's going on. There's another variable that gets adjusted up or down based on your choices or actions which affects whether you can get the best ending. This has even more of the less apparent kind of choices, and I think it was made this way intentionally. In some ways I feel it's similar to one of those psychological experiments where they don't tell you what they're really testing, or they trick you in some way and see what you do, and maybe you could learn a little bit about yourself from seeing where your choices land you. That said though, it's not perfect because Aside from that one variable, you also have to do one specific thing in this one situation where several of the possibilities were equally viable, or you'll end up getting the B ending instead of the best. And the best ending is really epic. It's so much better than the B ending that this one problem with it is kind of a fatal flaw. But I do still have a lot of respect for what they were trying to do. In the end, I do tend to recommend using a guide to get the best ending, even on your first play. <laughs> Number 5. The post-game dungeon, Seraphic Gate. After the ending of the normal game, an option appears on the title screen called Seraphic Gate, which is a dungeon where you have all the stuff you had in whichever save file you used to load it. Plus, they give you back all the characters you sent up to Asgard throughout the game, albeit at the level from when you sent them. If you play the main game on hard mode, you can also recruit some of the game's villains and temporary characters to your party. You can gain some new equipment here, and the bosses of the dungeon are the extremely powerful Gabriel Celeste and Ethereal Queen, recurring optional bosses who appear in most of the games made by Triace. Funnily though, a potentially more difficult fight than the bosses may be one of the normal enemies there, a fight against four hamsters who are absurdly powerful, but also tiny, making it difficult to hit them with some attacks. The Seraphic Gate is a recurring feature of the Valkyrie Profile series, and it's often a place where the developers have a little fun with what they put in there, and it's always a challenge. Number 4. The War in Asgard Every chapter, you're given criteria that Asgard wants you to deliver by sending a character out of your party permanently to fight for Asgard. This ties into getting the different endings, gets you loot as reward for sending good characters, and is one of the game's neat expressions of Norse mythology where it's really like you're being a Valkyrie. You get to see what the characters you've sent have been up to in Asgard between each chapter, and it's actually possible for them to die there, and while they're in Asgard, the game classifies the character as a god of some level, like 13th level god. Since you need to send strong characters, and it even warns you that you need to leave their equipment on them when you send them, you'll need to use that character in battle to train them. This gives you a reason to switch up your team over the course of the game, 
and you won't know what you need in later chapters, so it gives possible incentive to level everyone, so you'll always be prepared. There are a lot of characters, so it's nice that there's a reason to use all of them and experience more of what's in the game. Another thing that ties into the war in Asgard is that the characters have personality traits, both good and bad, and you can spend your skill points on increasing their virtues and decreasing their flaws. These make up a significant portion of their hero value, which determines how well they'll do in Asgard. It's interesting just to have stats for personality traits which can be leveled. It's funny that some of them are things like Love's Dad, and it's sometimes funny which traits they consider good or bad. For example, Reckless is a good trait, and Cool-Headed is bad. But remember, gods do not have human traits. Number 3. Exploring Dungeons by 2D Platforming 2D platforming is an unusual type of gameplay to have in an RPG, but it's actually pretty well done here. It has some interesting mechanics to it, where you can shoot out little bolts of ice that can freeze enemies, or form ice crystals against walls, floors, or ceilings that function as platforms. You can shatter the ice to form chunks that you can pick up and stack, or the explosion of the ice can launch you a good distance, and exploded ice leaves behind a temporary floating platform. Platforming challenges are used for hiding some of the treasure chests, so you get rewards for it too. Public service announcement, they also let you grab and hang from horizontal ropes or chains by holding up, and you can shimmy across them, and there are points where this is required, but the game never mentions you can do that. It's not in the instruction manual either. All in all, it's a pretty impressive 2D platforming moveset for an RPG. And the dungeons, especially those that only show up in hard mode, have good variety in their level design and some pretty clever puzzles. They'll have unique gimmicks or have you figure out new uses for your ice crystals, and the variety kept me wondering what they'd come up with next. Number 2. Its own version of Norse Mythology Norse Mythology is already a good setting for a fantasy RPG, but Valkyrie Profile's additions and changes are interesting too. I don't know all of what's the same as the mythology versus different, but here's some of the things I like. Being a Valkyrie, you actually get to recruit worthy warriors after their death so they may fight in Valhalla. A Valkyrie can appear with angel wings, which looks pretty cool, and she can fly, which is how you get around the world map. Kind of like if you started off a classic JRPG with an airship. A Valkyrie can sense warriors who are dead or in dire situations and see the events leading up to their death, and she can gather the warrior's soul to take with her. She can materialize those souls as people when needed for battle, which is how the party system works. It has its own takes on Odin, Freya, Ragnarok, and Fenrir, among others. The artwork for the Aesir gods of Asgard gives their clothing a stylistic consistency that speaks to their realm having its own distinct culture and sets them apart from the world's human cultures. The human world of Midgard has countries that seem inspired by Middle Ages European countries or by Japan, so the Valkyrie ends up recruiting knights as well as samurai. Strangely though, there's not a single character who seems like a Viking. I don't know how you leave them out of something like this. They also do some analysis of what are the differences between gods and humans in their universe, and the best ending is an interesting alternate take on the mythology too. Number 1. The Turn-Based Real-Time Hybrid Combat The combat takes place within a battle game engine separate from the exploration, which you enter once you attack or run into an enemy. Your team and the enemy team alternate turns in combat, but each turn consists of you initiating real-time combo attacks with all four of your party members freely until they've exhausted all their attacks. Enemies might block attacks or get hit. Some attacks launch the enemy into the air, and if you give the enemy a big enough gap in your attacks, it'll recover and start blocking again. And attacks use hitboxes and hit detection like a fighting game, so there's plenty of incentive to time your attacks well. The combo system is engaging and rewarding, and there are even strategic decisions you can make within it, whether you can afford to juggle the enemies more for extra XP, or hit them after they've fallen down to recharge your cooldowns. Even when you're just going through easy fights to level up, you still have the challenge of optimizing your combos to earn the most experienced gems you can from the fight, and the combos live up to the action shown in the game's trailer video. It still has the depth of enemy and ally frontline or backline positioning, 
and ranged or melee attacks. The main character has access to both ranged and melee weapons, and it allows weapon changes in battle, which ensures you usually have access to most tactical options. Different tactics can have significant impacts for some enemies, and character setup can have a significant impact too. It actually has a training mode, which is useful with the importance of combos, and with the game giving you strong reasons to switch up your team over time, it's good to have a way to get acclimated. Near the end of the game, you can set up your characters in such a way that your team is virtually unkillable, which can be pretty fun to survive against absurd damage numbers, and it mostly avoids feeling too overpowered because the fights at that point pretty much demand a setup like that. It does also burn through your items, so you can't keep it up forever, and you might prefer not to rely on it in easier fights. There are some problems. Like, some characters' attacks don't combo well into their own next attacks, or they might whiff completely on flying enemies until someone else hits them and they fall. It can be frustrating sometimes, but you usually can work around it with teamwork. Some weapons have a random chance of breaking on every turn that they're used. Several of those weapons are rare weapons that pretty much auto-kill certain types of enemies. For example, a Dragon Slayer sword that kills dragons. It's usually around a 5% chance of breaking, but if that does happen, it makes you think, this is such a rare item and does something amazing, so I'm going to have to reload my save. Combat being the strongest aspect is something I would say of a lot of Tri-Ace games. This has a great mix of action and strategy. Well, that's it for my top 7. If you've got any other points to add, let me know in the comments. I'm always interested just to know if other people have actually played this game, because they printed so few copies of it and it still has no digital release. I do hope the series is able to come back. Its most recent entry is Valkyrie Anatomia The Origin, a mobile game that hasn't been localized outside Japan. There's a possible spiritual successor in the game Exist Archive, The Other Side of the Sky. It's developed by Triace and has 2D platforming and a similar looking battle system. I do intend to try playing that at some point. Until next time, thanks for watching.